were um and then you know the environment was cleaned up. First time I was hearing about this stuff. Wow. It was totally new to me. There with social impact consultant. Hello everyone, my name is Efwa Ellens Ede with Social Impact Consulting. I'm a development consultant with 20 years of experience working with NGOs, international NGOs, and bilateral agencies to work in project support, monitoring and evaluation, and civil society strengthening. So now, I saw that local NGOs lack the capacity to manage large-scale projects, which can in turn impact their various communities because they have the connection based on their backgrounds. So this made me create this channel so that I can add value to you for free once you subscribe to this channel and get notified of upcoming videos. I look forward to hearing from you. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another lovely episode of the Development Sector Series, which is Dev Sector Series. I am Efwa Ede with Social Impact Consulting. Please like and share this video. Now, I've been trying to interview this guest since I started Dev Sector Series, um, and uh, I'm so excited about this conversation, especially the timing of this conversation as we head towards the 2023 election, organizing, civic engagement, advocacy. So I am very thrilled to have this very special guest. So um, like and share, like and share. Make sure those of you on Facebook, make sure you click on the notification so you can be notified when we go live. Um, YouTube, just click on the bell notification on YouTube to be notified when we go live. Okay, so I'm very excited. I'm LinkedIn. Just stay tuned. Follow me. You know, I am on creator mode on LinkedIn. So make sure you follow. Okay, so I'm very excited about this episode. Okay, so I am going to be having, um, you know, a really special guest that's going to be talking to us about citizen engagement and hashtag office of the citizen in Nigeria, you know, um, because I feel like that is the most important office um, in a democratic dispensation, period, in any dispensation. But, you know, the, the democracy has been structured that it is a, the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So the office of the citizen is the most important office of any democracy. So I'm very excited about and any and with enough is enough. One thing I like about their movement is that everything they do is people centered. OK, it's always citizen centered. It's always citizen engagement centered. It's, it's the people first, you know, which is which is something that I'm very thrilled about. And we're going to be hearing from this special guest. She she is the 2022 Global Citizen winner. You know, that is, man, I'm just stoked about this. So guys, make sure you just stay on. You know, one thing that is that is exciting about this episode and it's live, if you have any questions for her, you can just get your keyboards rolling and then ask your questions. One more favor, just put down your name and where you're watching from so that I can either be able to give you a shout out or I would just thank you personally um, after the episode is off. I'm going to try something new today. So after I'm done having a conversation with our guest, we are then going to be doing, giving, giving some special shout outs to people. So please put your name and where you're watching from. I'm on a, I'm on a platform where I will be able to see it. 
you know, YouTube can be funny sometimes, LinkedIn can be funny sometimes, but Facebook, you know, Facebook doesn't feel but but if I see it, I will give you a shout out. So if you give if you if you put your name and where you're watching from and I do not see it, it is counted to the system and not my heart. Okay. All right. So I am going to get you to our special guest. Now I'm gonna share you her video bio and we are gonna get rolling. All right, see you soon. Damulekun is an active citizen and connector. She currently serves as the executive director of Enough is Enough Nigeria, a nonpartisan network of individuals and organizations committed to building a culture of good governance and public accountability in Nigeria through active citizenship. Yemi has diverse careers spanning the public and private sectors in the U.S. and Nigeria. She volunteers for the Kaleyewa House, an NGO founded by her late mother, focused on the elderly. She is a 2018 CSC leader, a global program for exceptional senior leaders selected from government, businesses, and NGOs across 53 Commonwealth countries. In the same year, Yemi was named as one of the most influential people of African descent, MIPAD, endorsed by the United Nations in the humanitarian and religious category. In 2019, she joined the Africa program for the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, in the U.S. as a non-resident senior associate. In January 2022, Yemi was appointed to the editorial board of This Day Newspapers, and in May 2022, she won the Global Citizen Prize. Yemi grew up on the campus of the University of Ife, now Obafemi Awolowo University, but started her university education at the University of Lagos. She has a first degree in mathematics and economics from the University of Virginia, an MSc in Development Studies from the London School of Economics, LSE, and an MBA from Oxford University's said Business School. Allow me to introduce to some and present to others, Yemi Adamulekun, the Executive Director of Enough is Enough Nigeria. Hello, Yemi. How are you? Thank you so much, finally, for being here. I'm so excited. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Glad Good I could make it work. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You know, I've been. You know, you know, you're so busy. I've been trying to get you here for a while. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's twelve o'clock in the middle of a day, so it's a bit tricky, but we made it work, so it's all good. Thank you so much. So we are just going to get started. Um, um, you know what? Sometimes I just feel like the universe has its, its special timing because this is the perfect time to have a conversation because we're heading towards 2023 20, 20, and there's a lot going on. And I feel like with your expertise and firsthand experience, you'll be able to give us some, some, some very, very much needed insights. So we're going to get started. So what inspired you? Because based on your pedigree, you could be doing, you could be working in a stock firm. You could have started your own um, hedge fund. You could have, I mean, the list is endless. <laughs> you could start your own hedge fund. You could have been running one. You could, you said what? I said I could have a lot of money. That's the most, in all the things you are saying. <laughs> I I'm mean. just saying it like, or you could have even been working on the one and starting. I mean, because you're, because when I was looking at your bio, I'm like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> like this person is, this is a deliberate, um, um, this is deliberate. This is not a, a, a case of, oh, I just fell into it. You, you were saying, look, I am seeing society and I'm not just going to sit on the sidelines and complain. I'm going to do something. Because this is deliberate. So what, what was the inspiration behind you joining social movements? 
Interestingly, it wasn't actually. I actually fell into it, to use your words. Really? But in what you were saying about the different things I could be doing, just wanted to put it out there. I could just be making a lot more money. Civil society <laughs> is not the place you go if you want to make money. But so let me just put that out there. Yes. Funnily enough, I did fall into it. A friend, Bisola Edu, who serves on EIE's board, invited me to a protest in 2010. I was doing my youth service. It sounded like fun. And I went. So after the protest, since it was my youth service, I had time. So a lot of the post-protest meetings, I was able to help organize, take meeting notes, blah, 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 blah. And so we kind of started talking that, well, we can't protest every time we're upset. What do we want to do? Elections were 2011. So we thought it would be good to channel the anger. And the 2010 protest, which was called Enough is Enough, which was gave the name of the organization, at that time, President Yadua was sick, so there was a lot of uh, advocacy around making President Jonathan acting or well, substantive president since we didn't know, or acting president, sorry, since we didn't know what was going on with Yadua, if he was dead or alive. There were killings in Joss, and at that time, the killings seemed really bad, but fast forward 12 years, it's gotten like exponentially worse. And then there was forced scarcity. So those were the three things that literally got us out on the street. But now we said we can't get on the street every time we're upset. What do we want to do? Elections are 2011. So let's focus on getting young people to turn their anger into how they vote for elections. So I had time, was helping with taking notes. And then in January 2011, we had gotten seed grants from Omidia, uh, the founders of eBay, and MacArthur Foundation. We hired staff. She quit in February. Elections were in April. And since I had spent a lot of my time in 2010 with administrative stuff, we said, I'll lead the organization through elections in April, and then we'll hire somebody else. 12 years later, or 11 years later, I'm still here. So that's basically how enough is enough is. But I mean, I guess to your larger point, it does align with my beliefs in a more equitable Nigeria. So working here is not completely out of what I believe as well. Wow, that is that is really really amazing. I, I I guess I guess your story is just. I felt like the universe and God wanted you to be in this uh, in this space because the impact that EIE has made over the past past few past couple of years, not couple as in two or three past few <laughs> years, a de past decade. Is, is 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 just really laudable. So again, again, well done. So I, I wanted to now dive in a bit deeper. Can you just talk to us a bit about how people power has impacted your work over the years? I mean, to be honest, it's really at the heart of it. I think for me, I took a lot of things for granted just by virtue of how I grew up and my exposure. So it simply just made sense. And I guess my understanding of democracy you vote people in and out of office, that citizens have power because we vote. And so that's really at the heart of democracy. We can't all decide uh, about a policy. So we elect people to make those decisions for us, but with the caveat that they are making that decision for us, not their own decision. So you are representing people and what people want. And that's literally the heart of democracy. But I took it for granted that in Nigeria, we don't teach democracy. So we shouldn't assume, or we assumed that people understood how it should work. And I say this, I'm Yoruba. The word for government in Yoruba is Ijoba, which means a king's domain. Mm -hmm. Now, a king, a king is rarely impeached. It happens, but very rarely, and it takes extraneous circumstances. The king's word is final. When the king dies, usually it's his son that takes over or somebody within the ruling family. So there, a, there's a very different dynamic with how you engage hierarchical or monarch, mon, monarchies, if I want to use that word. That's very different from a democracy. In a democracy, citizens have power, citizens have agency, citizens have voice. You don't have that in a kingdom, for the most part, even though they sometimes make a big and do about consulting with the elders in the community, but ultimately the king has the final say. So if we contrast that with the tenets of a democracy that gives agency and primarily even our constitution says that a document is for the on behalf of the people. 
So that's a very different way. And so we can't be saying Ijoba in one way and then expecting people to challenge the king in another way without explaining how those things are connected or finding a different word for government or, or uh, in, a, in, a different, in a different way. So I think so, for me that was really... Sorry, go ahead. So over the years, as, as, um, as EIE has been going out to sensitize communities about that difference, that, that differential you're talking about, how, 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 has it, how have they received that information? And the, did you see a shift as you guys, as you all were working up to this date? Just so when we started, as I said, there was an, an assumption, I think on my part, first of all, it was an organization that was not planned. So we kind of, as I said, we, we made it up as we were going along. So it took me a while to understand that because that was my own personal bias and what people understood or didn't understand. And then in 2014, Antiobi Ezekiel spoke at an event where she talked about the office of the citizen. Mm. It resonated with what we were trying to do and suddenly there was an expression and a framing for what it is that we were trying to do. Let citizens understand that they have an office, they have agency and they have power. And so we designed a logo for it. And as Antiobi says, we literally just ran with that concept of office of the citizen. So when EIA turned five in 2015, we kind of launched that. And that became a very big part of who we are and what we try to do. It's actually the logo, oh, wrong hand. It's actually the logo on my T-shirt. Um, that's basically the Nigerian office, like of, official logo for the president. So instead of saying office of the president, mm. it says office of the president the federal yes. of the So now, EIE as an organization, just because of the way we were structured, has focused from the very beginning on reaching Nigeria's educated elite. So we don't do a lot of on the streets um, awareness at the lower end of Nigeria's socioeconomic strata. Just one, we were small, and we found that social media was cheaper mm, as a way to spend a lot of time reaching out to that particular demographic. Now, as we've gone along to your point, we've then migrated into radio, which, which is a much wider audience. So that, and then not just radio, but then radio in multiple languages. So that has allowed us to reach more people. And yes, for those who get the idea that they have power, I mean, one of my favorite ones is a radio program in Enugu, where the government has said Okada shouldn't be on, I guess, a major road, but police were extorting that because people did not understand, in a sense, the same, like, there, let's say there are 10 roads. So you can't drive your car down two roads. Because, because police realized that they didn't know. If you drove on any of the other eight roads, they will still find, or maybe six other roads, they will still I find see. you and say you were breaking the law. So someone called and complained about it on our radio show. And we were like, no, that's not true. That it's only on these two roads. The commissioner of police heard about it and came on the radio show and said, yeah, that it's only on these two roads that any other road is fine. So that, for example, is... Uh, an, an example of people understanding the power that they have and using that to engage and complain. A very interesting one that always happens is government officials. People just don't recognize that they can call them and ask them questions. So every time our radio shows are designed that way, we listen to a problem and then we tell you the officer who's in charge of fixing that. If you have the number of the officer, we give it to you and we tell you to call and engage. And nine times out of ten, people will be like, we can call them. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. And we're like, yes, they work for you. They're your employees. And so when people call and then come back on radio, either very excited that they got something resolved, or actually there's a particular gentleman who was very excited that his senator kept hanging up. So he was very excited that he was disturbing his senator and distressing him. <laughs> <laughs> that was his own point of joy. But I would call him, he'll hang up. I will call him back again. I will call him back again. So yeah, it's it's been interesting to see how people engage. But it takes it takes a lot. I mean, for someone to be calling the same person back, you are burning credit. You're taking time. So it takes a lot for people to continue to, to do those things. Wow, amazing, amazing work. And and I think what ex it's exciting is the impact of your work by citizens being really engaged. Um, so. Which goes to us our next question. So is citizen engagement on the rise as we head towards the 2023 elections? 
So, um, because as I've been studying movements over the past decade, uh, I feel like enough is enough is either leading the movement or a part of the movement or providing support, um, whether technical support or whatever kind of support for the movement. So can you talk about um, how citizen engagement is as we're heading towards the 2023 elections? I think it's increased. So if we start from, so 2023 will be my fourth election involved in EIA in whatever capacity. Wow. So if you take it from the 2011 election to now, I think citizens have gotten a lot more aware of the power that they have. And social media is a very good one. So after the 2011 elections, for example, social media played a huge role in that. And that's part of why enough is enough is quite strong on social media. A lot of government officials came on social media. They opened Facebook accounts. Even, I mean, President Jonathan talked about the fact that he was the first Facebook president. I think he declared that he was <laughs> really funny like that. A lot of them came on social media, Twitter and Facebook primarily, to engage, quote unquote. But they all ran back. Why? It was a very different dynamic for them because social media is bi-directional. So if you're talking on the TV, I can't respond to you. Well, I can be shouting in my house. If you're talking on radio, if it's not a call-in program and I, my call gets picked up, I can also be shouting in my house or in my car. You can't hear. But on Twitter or on Facebook, as you are tweeting, I am responding. And at that time, Twitter, even in the early days, Twitter had, I forget, one, maybe 120 characters or whatever it was. So we didn't have the luxury of space of saying, dear, your excellency. is We just start, Dino, what you are saying is a lie. I mean, so people were very frontal and very direct because the, the medium didn't give you the space for niceties. And citizens were also very clear about calling lies out or calling misinformation out. And government officials were not used to that. So as quickly as they signed up with accounts, they quickly retreated and stopped engaging. And that's why someone like a Ruben Abati used the frame, uh, phrase, children of anger. Because suddenly there was a platform where I could speak. There was a platform where I didn't need to make an appointment. I didn't need to know who knew you or find someone. I could just speak them. Right so I think 2011 now till now, what has also changed is they've now all come back to social media. But they've also, in a sense, created a, an economy. So you have a minister that has a special assistant new media. Or our president, let me even start with our president. Our president has a special assistant new media for Hausa, new media for English, digital media. Then you have the ones that are doing traditional media. So it's created a, like a job market where a lot of government officials have special assistants. But from a citizen's perspective, I think the ability for citizens to speak and get a response. Now, for example, the police force, Nigeria police force, has a PR, a public relations officer, who has an account on Twitter and engages citizens on Twitter. So I don't need to go to Abuja. And that doesn't mean that there's equal access. He still picks mm -hmm. and chooses what he, what he engages on, but he's there. In mm -hmm. Lagos, he's there. INEC is also an important one. They're on social media. So to the degree that government has had to respond on news platforms to citizens asking and demanding and, and using their voice, wanting response, for me, I say it's increased citizen engagement quite, quite significantly. Is it enough? Certainly. Certainly. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you just um, provide some insights on like the Twitter band and what kind of um, got it to that point? And now what made them eventually have to open up Twitter, especially now during elections where people are talking and where, you know, some, some aspirants are even stronger on those platforms than others. So how, like, like can you just provide some insights on that for, for a second? Well, I'll start with your last point. Yeah, some aspirants yeah. or candidates are stronger on social media. But as you say, INEC doesn't count tweets. At, INEC at counts all. tweets. So as strong yeah. as they are on social media, they don't get on the on election day, there will mm -hmm. be strong complaining on social media after, <laughs> the results, after the results are out. I think, so Twitter ban, why did the government unban it? To be fair, mm -hmm. I honestly think it's because of elections. Okay. Nothing, for, I mean, they were making noise about Twitter having to open an office, blah, blah, blah. As far as I'm concerned, Twitter has not opened an office, as far as I can tell. I don't know that Twitter's policies in any way has changed. We got a loss, uh, court judgment, and the ECOWAS court. Since our Nigerian courts 
are afraid of government. We got a judgment at the ECOWAS court saying the Twitter ban was illegal. But I believe that they've backtracked because they need it for elections. Mm -hmm. Both parties, APC and PDP, used, I mean, APC used social media heavily. And that's part of the criticism that you came into power on the back of Twitter. And now that you're in power, you don't like to be criticized and you want to shut it down. Now, hear me clearly. Do people use social media as with anything badly? Yes. Are there people who hide behind anonymous accounts and foster violence, instigate disinformation, misinformation? Certainly. But let's also not forget that at least in Nigeria today, the biggest engine of propaganda is the Nigerian government. In two ways. One, in not providing information. So when you leave a vacuum, don't get upset when people fill it in number one. Then number two, when you're deliberately, what's the word I'm looking for? Deliberately framing information in a certain way that we all know to be false. You've set yourself up for saying that you yourself are playing the game of propaganda. So what gives you the moral authority to say that certain citizens are doing the same thing? Now, Twitter ban was banned because they felt that the president's tweets should not have been taken down. Facebook didn't take it down. Why did Twitter take it down? They were upset with uh, IPOP and how IPOP was using Twitter to instigate violence and things of that nature. Twitter has a process for how you take down tweets that governments uh, can use. And at the time, if I'm not mistaken, Paradigm Initiative talked about the fact that Nigerian, the Nigerian government hadn't used the process to complain about the things they wanted to complain about. I see. The way that you now decided to deal with it was to ban Twitter. And again, the Nigerian government for national security, which is what they claim, has the right to ban Twitter. But you can only do it two ways. You either go to court and get a judgment, or you change the law. They neither went to court nor changed the law. They picked up the phone and called the service providers and said, in the interest of national security, block Twitter. It doesn't work that way. And that really was our issue. We're saying, fine, national security. I mean, I don't, I'm not privy to all the information the federal government is privy to. So I don't know what information you have that got you worried. It's fair point. But there are processes to do these things, and you can't wake up as you will and do as you believe, which is why the ECOWAS court found in our favor. But I believe they unbanned it for very selfish reasons. They need it for elections. Mm, I see. OK. That, that, is, that is some much, much needed insight. Um, so we're just going to go into um, the campaign that you all have been riding on for for a while, um, the Office of the Citizen. Can you provide some more insight and uh, so that the viewers uh, and the listeners can then, um, you know, align with the Office of the Citizen and, and uh, you know, move our country forward? Well, I mean, as I said, we got it from Antiobi and then found out that it's been in use for quite a number of years. I think we found quotes going back to the late 19th century, the concept of the Office of the Citizen. But in, interestingly enough, when she said it, she had never heard about it. For her, it just mm. cap captured what citizens should be doing. And to be honest, that's really the idea. The idea that as a citizen, you feel empowered enough to know that I have an office, I have rights, I have responsibilities, and I can hold people in elected office accountable. Unfortunately, I say that three things shape how we engage, how we don't fully occupy our office of the citizen. Number one, we underestimate just how much the history of military rule affects how we engage government. Under military rule, you kind of leave government. Nobody wants to go to jail. Nobody wants to get killed. So you just leave government. Number two, our culture. As I said, I'm a Yoruba girl. As a, we defy a lot to people who are older. And by the nature of our politics, people who are in elected office tend to be older much old, or much older. Um, president Buhari is knocking on 80, and some of the presidential candidates are in their 70s. We have senators in their 70s and 60s. So asking people who you've elected into office how they spend money or how they make decisions can come across as rude from a cultural context. Yes. Challenging them. We are asking them questions. We are demanding answers. And this doesn't have to be confrontational. It can just literally be a simple question. But it comes across as if you are overstepping your bounds as a young person. 
So we tend to defer to them, which is why when they enter a room, we all stand up, your excellency, your honorable, if you would please, da 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 da, da. So the nature of our language seeds power to elected officials. And it's a constant thing in the way that, from even engagements, how they are seated, how we are seated, how we ask questions. And so subconsciously that works in our brain as well, in how we engage authority and those in elected office. And then lastly, religion. Nigeria is a very religious society, not spiritual, very religious society. So if I take Christianity, which is what I practice, even in the way that we engage God and our language, we say God is in control. God did. It is well. It's. So that nature of language, we again seed power. So all culturally, we seed power and positioning to those in authority, in elected office. Religion also forces us in this. Oh, we've allowed religion to shape us into seeding power as well. So we expect God to come down and solve problems. In Islam, it's just this concept of the fact that Allah knows all and nobody comes to power without Allah's knowledge. So who am I to question kind of mindset? So those three things shape how we engage government. And so it's been really very difficult to keep reiterating that as a citizen, you have power, you have authority, you have agency. And what we find that has worked really is trying to tell success stories of citizens that have owned their office. So it's one thing, one thing to teach about the office and what it means. Then it's another thing to support citizens as they engage on that in that journey. As you said, with information, with access. So with our website, Shine Your Eye, for example, we're curating phone numbers and email addresses of government officials, so it gives you access. And then the third step of it is storytelling. How do we share stories of success? So citizens can see another citizen and be like, oh, if that person can do it, maybe I can give it a try. Hmm. This is really, this is, this is, um, this is really interesting. I'm used to, because, you know, as an organizer that had some experience in the U.S., I'm used to hearing these stories. These stories were nothing in the U.S. when you're empowering citizens in terms of citizen engagement. When I got to Nigeria, I just saw that, you know, they didn't, a lot of citizens didn't feel like they had that voice. And, um, you know, but with, with EIE, I see the engagement on social media and I also, you know, monitor you all on the news and hearing a lot of how citizens have been able to be very frontal with government. You know, that's really amazing what you all have been doing. And a lot of a lot of um, organizers like you are just in the trenches. Yes, you see the work you do, you get recognition here, recognition there, but you all are deep in the trenches, you know, just making sure because, you know, like the, like they say in Pigeon, problem, no, they finish. So you're <laughs> kind of going. Especially uh, in Nigeria. Yes. <laughs> you know, so just, just amazing work. Um, let me, let me, let me get to our next question. And this is kind of um, to speak to your foresight. Where do you foresee our de democracy moving forward? Hmm. Interesting. I think, to be honest, we're not yet doing the hard work of teaching what a democracy is. And I think to get it in a sense where it's meaningful to everybody, we must be deliberate about teaching what it means. What, what is a democracy? I mean, we talk about the phrase dividends of democracy. What does that mean? What does that mean for an uh, 18-year-old student who is stuck at home and has been at home for six months? Is this democracy? Is this what democracy means? We've been protesting, we've been talking, government doesn't care. Is this what democracy is? That I, my education is not important. So I think moving forward, we need to be a bit more deliberate to get the dividends of democracy and get the outcomes that we want. We need to be more deliberate about teaching about it, teaching what democracy means. And there's been a lot of school of thought about do we, does Africa need to fashion its own type of democracy? taking into consideration our traditional understanding of authority and power and governance and all of that. I think, I mean, I think that horse has left the stable. I'm not quite sure how we want to draw this one back and say, <laughs> let's, do some, let's do it differently. Mm -hmm. I, I believe we will eventually shape it differently, but it's in the doing. It's not mm -hmm. that we just pause and invent a new one, but that we'll find that maybe in another 20, 30 years, it would look a different way. That maybe it does in 
I'm at in the US, for example. I mean, the US is presidential. England is parliamentarian. China is not a democracy as we know it, but within their party, there's a democratic type of system because they vote people, but it's not a general countrywide vote. So yeah, we might eventually figure something out. Yeah, I, I think that was what was one of my observations when I came back to Nigeria. I'm like, is the normal westernized democracy, I don't, does it work for us? And we probably need to do what, so what you're saying is really, this is really foresight in terms of what works for us as Nigerians and Africans. But, you know, I guess we're on our way. <laughs> um, so you've alluded to this question. You've, you've made touch points about it throughout our conversation today um, in terms of citizen engagement. Um, but like just for like a regular um, young person who is on his laptop or like somebody in the market or somebody in their shop, like how can they, like, or a banker, you know, middle management, how can citizens, regular citizens participate in governments like right now as we speak, like from where they are? I think the most important thing is that every citizen needs to understand that government, governance, politics, whatever word, affects your way of life and your quality of life. Mm -hmm. It's governance that determines if your public school is good enough for your children to go to or you have to send them to a private school. It's governance that determines the quality of roads you drive on. It's governance that determines if your public hospital, your general hospital, Nigerian Palace, is good enough or you have to find money to go to a private hospital. So I think we need to understand that these things are personal. They affect our lives. That governance is not just them. It's not just Abuja or the capital city. It is your life. It is if you have an accident on Third Midland Bridge, but an ambulance can't get to you, and you die not because your injuries were bad, but because you didn't get care for six hours when you needed care within an hour. So all those things, I don't think we're, we're, saying, we're connecting the dots enough for citizens to understand. So how can citizens participate? From where you are, a very easy one is to vote. Voter registration has ended, so if you didn't register, well, I'm sorry. But if you did register, pick up your PVC and participate. At least pay attention to the people who are saying, look, think about it this way. They've applied for a job to work for you. I've applied as a senator to work for you, House of Rep member to work for you, governor to work for you, president to work for you. So think about it enough that somebody has applied for a job. Pay attention to who the candidates are. They are saying they want to work. Scrutinize them and then vote on election day, number one. That's probably the easiest one. Number two, once they are in office, pay attention to who is in office and what is of importance to you. Is it that you think your roads are bad, you want water, schooling if you're a parent? And begin to engage and understand who is responsible for what. Unfortunately, I would say that it is a lot of work. I mean, if I take Lagos, for example, for people who maybe live in the mainland, what we call Lagos, Ikeja, Bagada, mainland, or work on the island, Ikoi, Victoria Island. A lot of people have to wake up at 4 a.m. to get yes. on the road, to be at work on time. By the yes. time you do that at 4, and you don't get home till 10, 11 because of traffic, and you do that five days a week, I certainly understand why chasing one local government chairman or one senator is the least of your problems. But we need to understand that the traffic and your stress in that area is tied to them not doing their jobs. So it's connected and it's not going to solve itself, which is why we try to encourage people to work in groups. Because as a person, there's only so much you can do. One of our favorite stories that was a read from our, one of our radio programs was a road in Ecology in Lagos that the community needed fixed. And they formed themselves into a committee such that if somebody went to the, uh, the government office one day, you didn't have to take off the next day for work. Somebody else would go. So it's not one person that had to keep taking days of work and keep following up. One person faced the commissioner of works. Another person faced the house of rep member. Another person faced, I think, maybe their local government. So they split the work. So it wasn't heavy on one person. And then they also mapped out their plan. You do this. Then they got the media involved. 
So it takes a bit of work. And I think that's, I, I don't want to dismiss the fact that it's a lot of work. But I also recognize that when we work together in communities to organize, I mean, just like anything, uh, what it is, a teamwork makes the dream work. It reduces the burden to get the results that we want. But ultimately, what we need to keep in mind is that, as with anything, if pressure is not applied to someone who has applied for a job to deliver on that job, the person will do the barest thing. Mm. And to either make peace with that and keep complaining from now to kingdom come, or be ready to do a bit of engagement to get them to do the job that they are planning. Thank you so much for that. I think I, that that is a very workable way, especially customizing it to a place like Lagos. Um, okay, so we have them. Um, so if there are any any questions from the audience, if you guys can let me know if you have any questions for uh, Yemi, we can we can start to answer them. So while while we're waiting for your questions and your your comments or what have you, we are going to let her just go ahead and give her final thoughts. And if we get your questions, we can, uh, we will now come back to it and then uh, move forward, okay? All right, so we're waiting for your questions. So if you have any questions for her, please put it down in the comments, like I said earlier. So we'll be waiting for those. So again, Yemi, this was just, it was the, the, the your responses were very tight, were very succinct and they are, they are workable. So if somebody watches this, or once I edit it and I'm sharing it, I feel like it's stuff that can, that I feel it's workable. Come together with it, um, as a committee and just take on an issue. And I think that is, I feel um, the challenge in, in a place like Nigeria, if somebody can just take on a local issue, you get, if there's a speed bump on the road, who is to fix the speed bump? Who do we need to talk to? Have they allocated money for it? So it's just, I feel like once you start working on a local issue, then you see where it's connected. And then before you know it, <laughs> you become an organizer or, you know, or decide to become an elected official, who knows? So, um, so if you can just give us your final thoughts. Sure. I think two things to your point, when you mentioned that about become a, an, uh, an elected official, that's also a way citizens can participate in governance, mm -hmm. actually run for office. If you have the temperament for it, you're interested in it, certainly join a political party. You have to join a party to contest in Nigeria. So join a political party and run for elections. That's, that's certainly a way to. And another one that I forgot is that we underestimate the influence that we have in certain groupings. So certain either be it your office. I mean, imagine if you are an entrepreneur and your office is the biggest thing in an environment, either in terms of physical building, or in terms of an employ employer of labor, you can leverage that to engage government because you pay taxes. And so you can use that to have a conversation about this or not. And that goes to both profit-making businesses and non-profits, and in this case, cough, cough, churches and mosques. Sit on, you, I mean, sitting on some prime piece of real estate and the road in front of your, your church is rubbish. Use that leverage to actually engage government around fixing that road. Have a meeting. You have people, you have influence over people. Say it all the time, religious leaders get to speak to their congregants more than their congregants will ever hear their governor or their president speak. So use that, inf use that influence, not only in terms of educating, ah, that's another one, educating your congregants about governance, but also the fact that you have access to 2,000 people is something that government will pay attention to. In how in how you use it. Mm. So my final thoughts: um, as we go towards elections, we tend to spend a lot of energy on presidential, who is going to be president, and it's understandable because either I'm in Lagos or in Taraba or Enugu, we have one president, so all of us can have a conversation about that one person. But if I'm in Lagos, Taraba, or Enugu, we all have three different governments. We have three different senators three different House of Rep members. So if I'm shouting about my senator, my friend in Taraba doesn't concern him. My friend in Enugu doesn't concern him. So it's a bit of a challenge to, so it's easier to galvanize noise around a presidential candidate. But let's not forget, at this coming election, we're electing a president plus his deputy, his vice. Most 28 states are electing a governor and their deputy. Everybody has one senator. We all have one House of Rep member. 
and we have one state of house of assembly member. Please pay attention to these five roles and what they are offering, and let's vote with sense. All this anger, typing online, tweeting, forwarding on WhatsApp, commenting in bars, just venting and venting. Ultimately, whoever comes into office is because people voted. And if you are passionate enough about your candidates and you think they can deliver, choose to engage, mobilize, raise money, tell other people in your community, and ensure that the person who you think has the capacity, the character to deliver, gets into office. As you occupy your office of the citizen. Aha, that's it. So when you're thinking about the office of the president and office of the governor, you occupy your office of the citizen so you can determine who occupies those offices. That That is gold. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Uh, uh, Yemi, for this uh, for this conversation, um, this 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 is just gold, and I feel like the, you know, when I I keep telling people that when you know what you are doing is when you can when I can explain it to my nine year old son, and he understands it. The way you've explained the office of the citizen and the way you've explained movement building, it's it's just simplified that every, anybody can understand it. So. Um, thank you. Thank you again so much for your time. And, uh, you know, I, I just had this idea that popped up. I'm going to stream this live on Twitter. And uh, because this is this is a conversation I feel like everybody needs to hear. Again, thank you so much. Thank and, you very uh, much for having Thank me. you so much. Thank you so much for being here. All right. And thanks for Take doing this. How, this is your, how long have you been doing this? I've been doing this. This is my second year. Oh wow! So this is every week. So we're talking every week. Like over a hundred episodes. Yes, I've been doing this every week for the past two weeks because it's my passion. I feel like people don't understand the role of civil society. When you're talking about civil society, people are people are they, there's just such a mixed bag about what people are saying in about civil society. And I'm like, Nigeria has not gone into anarchy because of civil society organizations like EIE and others that are in the trenches. So I just feel the need to communicate that. So yeah. So we've been doing this for about two years. Okay, thank you so much for being here. All right, take care, bye-bye. All right, guys. So this was just such an awesome conversation with, uh, with Yemi Adamuleku, who is a global citizen uh, winner um, and uh, the executive director of Enough is Enough Nigeria. So uh, again, thank you so much for um, thank you so much for listening. Um, again, I just want to thank a couple. I just want to just give a couple of shout outs for people who for people who came. So from YouTube, I see uh, Felicia Stephen Okoye from London. Thank you for being here. And then from LinkedIn Live, Chinedu Isagba um, from Lagos. And then I have Dr. Bridget Egbohan watching on Facebook from Lagos. And then I have um, I have um, Ibodage Ahabwe watching from Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you so much. And then I have a comment here from um, Felicia Stephen Okoye uh, saying, from now on, I must occupy my office of a citizen. Thank you. So that is a good way to round this out. Again, thank you so much for, for watching. Um, next week, we're going to be having an interesting conversation about education. I'm very, very excited about having this very special guest um, next week. Um, so please just continue to share this video so that more people know about the work that we're doing, communicating about the role of civil society. Um, again, Untold Impact, the role of civil society in development is coming up real soon. I'm so excited. <laughs> it's so, so excited about it. It's coming up real soon. Um, talking about what civil society, the critical role civil society has played in our nation so far. Again, guys, thank you so much for watching and let us change the world together. Take care. Bye-bye.